Dr. Nell's back to talk to all of us again. Dr. Nell, thank you so much for joining us. Have fun. Well, hi guys. I'm glad to um, that glad that you're back, and um, we will just start plunging into my second pediatric um, presentation. Um, thank you for the questions that you uh, sent to me from my previous one. Um, I, I like I told you, I kind of um, did the um, university professor answer on some of them as far as also encouraging your interest in things and so to look some of those questions up yourself you guys had great questions and I always encourage um, self-education as well so um, we um, this is just my intro page so you can move on past oops go ahead so we kind of um, touched on this in my last presentation as far as pediatrics. Um, and I could definitely see, and definitely 100 years ago, the question is, what's the big deal? Can't, aren't they just like adults, but um, smaller? And I think over the last 150 years or so, and like I, um, we'll kind of touch base on that in this presentation as well, we've really come to understand that you, pediatrics is its own, um, its own its own, its own um, spe specialty inside of medicine. You cannot treat kids like small adults. We have very different um, diseases. We have def definitely different things that we worry about. We, um, they also recover very differently. They handle medications and drugs very differently. They get injured very differently just based on their size and their large head. Um, but if you think of something as far as on the adult side, um, one thing would be heart attack, right? So that's a very common adult thing. Well, the question is, do you, that you could give to me is, do we see that on the pediatric side? The easy answer is, of course, but nowhere near um, what, we, what we would see in the adult um, population. And the reasons why a kid might have a heart attack is so much different than what an adult would have, a, reasons why an adult would have a heart attack. Same thing goes to with a stroke. Um, that is a big area of, um, of adult medicine. And then if you came to me and said, hey, Dr. Nell, can a kid have a stroke? And the answer, of course, is yes. But the reasons why a kid would have a stroke and how they might present might be different and um, what you do about it might be different. And um, also the percentage of my kids that have a stroke versus the percentage of 80 year olds um, that have strokes are completely, completely different. So um, that's kind of a long winded answer to that, to that question. So we can go ahead. So um, one of the things that we have known throughout history and when you um, read historical fiction or if you um, enjoy history, is kids, um, kids didn't necessarily live very long, or they were kind of known as being weak. They were known as being delicate, and the, this is kind of touches on the reason why. Um, so in the late 19th century, so in the late 1800s, in the U.S., it was expected that about out of every 1,000 children born, about 200 might be expected to die over, um, before the one year of age, so about 20%. So if you at all um, go through cemeteries um, just for interest, which is, sounds a little weird, but it can be fascinating, it is not uncommon to see um, uh, headstones with children on them. Also, um, around you know late 1800s, um, the camera was something new, right? So it's the box with the big light that you hand, you know, hang that you hold up or whatnot, and that was such a new discovery. But what families would find is their child might die prematurely, but they never had um, any pictures of them at all during their lifetime. So these two examples of, I mean, it's, I guess, a little gruesome of dead kids um, is because that was probably the only picture that they would have of, of their child at all because they just didn't have... Um, a photograph of them when they were alive, but they definitely, with their grief, um, wanted a picture of them, at least one picture of them. Um, so a lot of times, obviously back in history, you know, funerals would be held maybe in the house, 
which is also why you see that picture off to the off to the left. But this was probably if you start going through historical photography and pictures, this would probably be the only picture that a family would have of their child. Next. Hmm. So um, this is kind of a graph as far as um, United States mortality per age. So it starts at 1900 and goes all the way to 1969. And this graph I think is just so impressive when it shows um, overall how kids, so that red line that's the most obvious is under a year of age, that they were these frail, delicate little things. When you look at the percentages as compared to all the other age groups, this graph shows it at about um, 16%, um, which is similar to the last um, stat that I showed to you as far as 20%. So um, in this lecture, we'll kind of touch on why. Why did kids die? Why are they considered frail and weak? And then also, uh, I will hope to explain to you why we have seen this increase um, throughout history. And then also, um, I will kind of talk about child death a little bit um, and pediatrics as far as where we are today. Okay. So this I thought was an interesting graph. Um, it really shows infant mortality and how it really corresponded to industrial growth. Um, obviously, this is from 1810 to 1910, so over a 100-year period. And this, too, I will kind of touch on um, during this lecture as far as, okay, you have people working basically in factories and what kind of living conditions does that look like? And then things that we take for granted today as far as you know, after a woman has a baby, how long does she get to stay home with that baby before she has to go back to work? Um, you know, what what is the success of breastfeeding? Um, if you have a mom that has to that has to go back and work in her in her factory a week after giving birth, that baby's life is really in jeopardy as far as someone taking adequate care of it. And then, what do you feed that baby? Um, so I just thought this was an interesting um, uh, picture as far as how industry has affected our infant mortality. Next. So one of the other things is when you do look at the industrial age um, in history, people flocked from the rural areas and moved to the urban areas, right? So what did those urban areas look like? And especially if it was a you know quick quick over just maybe a decade of years as far as a quick increase and large increase of people living in cities. And the big one is people live close together, right? So that's that picture on the left as far as people just lived on top of each other. And I have a slide in a little bit too that kind of shows, shows what that's like. Um, and we know that if you are in close contact with each other, um, you are more likely to catch illnesses. Um, the picture on the, uh, on the right, I think, is also interesting, and what I also touch on is our sanitation system, right? So you have these urban areas jumping up in populations over a very short amount of time, and there are things that people have never considered before. So that's the sanitation when, like this, like this picture, a, a horse dies in the street. Whose responsibility is it to do something about it? Obviously, the person who owned that horse probably wouldn't do anything. Where do you take it? It's heavy. I mean, how? where would you even take it? And then the city doesn't have any infrastructure to set up to take care of that dead horse. So every time that it rained, I'm sure it did not smell well. Um, and then where does that water go? I mean, once again, you don't have a sewer system necessarily. A lot of these homes still, even though you can see the outside and they look like apartment type buildings, they wouldn't have indoor water or in, indoor um, toil, working toilets. So you still would go back into some back you know, area behind these buildings and still use some sort of pit, you know, outhouse pit toilet type area. And then obviously that is an area too where, is, where diseases can be passed from, from one to another. So with the rise of the industrial age, there came a whole lot of problems that also, um, also came with it. Next. So like I said, this is kind of a picture too that I just found on some pictures that I found on the internet as far as what life was like in cities. 
So um, the bottom left is crowded school room. Look how tiny that is um, and how close together those kids are. Um, the one up top is basically, I don't even know, like a one room apartment where you do your best to stack as many people as you can. And that house may or may not have a window associated with it. There may be a common area for cooking and then the outhouse in the back. So same with this picture of this mother with you know, kids just stacked on each other everywhere. These are just exact examples of where and how diseases can um, easily go through populations and very quickly. I think with what 2020 has shown us and how educated, much more educated now than the, the general population has been about infectious disease and infection control, I think is incredible. Um, these are, this is a lecture that I would give every year, and I have to say this is the first time that I can give this lecture and comfortably know that you guys can understand this concept. You guys can understand how diseases can easily go through this one room classroom very, very quickly. All, you know, our CDC guidelines and our state guidelines for COVID is to keep six feet apart. That six feet, just for you, the record is an arbitrary arbitrarial number. I oh, that was a tongue twister. Um, and right now, um, it's interesting because some of the data is coming out now is, is it six feet? Maybe it's nine feet. Maybe we're okay at three feet. Um, so some of that data is coming out now. That six feet, um, keeping six feet apart was really just kind of guessed at. And now that some time is going past, um, our researchers are really looking at that. And there's a lot of factors that say that maybe six feet is still too close, especially, especially if somebody is actively coughing or sneezing, that nine feet might be, um, might be more, might be safer. So I digress, but um, I have to say, I know that all 100 of you out there fully can grasp this idea better than any of my previous classes on how diseases and in, um, infections can really go through a population very quickly. So um, you could also say, well, Dr. Nell, do we still have this problem today? And I would say absolutely. These are two pictures of um, some of our third world poor nations in, um, in the world. The top picture, um, you can see how they're all still kind of living on top of each other. And then they have this common river where all their sewage um, drains into. Um, and obviously not great for weather protection. I believe that's in Vietnam. Um, I can't remember though, don't quote me on that. And then my bottom picture too is without proper sanitation, you just have garbage just um, piling up on each other on, on itself and people live this way. So when you have poor sanitation, um, you have people living on top of each other. It is just the perfect petri dish for infections to spread. All right, so back in history, the causes of infant death. So once again, infant, I would say probably a year of age um, or younger is, um, is this list. Um, diphtheria was number one, and I have a slide kind of showing that in a little bit. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but measles is on this list. Um, the last one is whooping cough, that is otherwise known as pertussis. Um, you get that, um, uh, so several of these we have vaccines for, right? So whooping cough is, um, well, it's an atypical kind of bacteria, but I don't, my med, my medications and antibiotics don't really work so well for that. So the best way to protect against pertussis or whooping cough, which, which hits more significantly to my, my small baby, is a vaccine. Typhoid, I have a vaccine for it. It's not required in this country, but if you do go traveling to some of these third world countries, I would highly recommend it. And obviously we have um, travel centers to also say what vaccines you should need before you travel to certain areas. Um, uh, diarrheal illnesses are a big one, um, even nowadays with our children all over the world. Um, because their bodies are smaller, if you start really having a ton of diarrhea in an infant or a child, they become much more dehydrated 
faster and to a higher extreme than you do with a bigger body. They're just, when you have a bigger body like an adult or like you guys are with big, being big teenagers, you have more water in your body. So when you start losing it, it's, it's a smaller percentage of what your whole body needs and requires and contains. When you have a little kid, two-year-old, four-year-old, when they start having the same amount of copious diarrhea, they lose a higher percentage of what their total wa water volume is in just that small, smaller body. So diarrheal illnesses all over the world is still one of our major causes of, um, of death um, on our planet. Um, and yeah, and in this country too, we have um, still have diarrheal illnesses and we will still have child death um, if it's not picked up um, quickly. Um, we now have a vaccine too for a virus called rotavirus, which is a GI um, gastrointestinal virus that would hit kids and hit kids really quite severely. It's kind of interesting because I still don't think I'm very old um, when it comes to the history of medicine. Um, I, I just work at a small amount of time when you look at all of history. But in my lifetime, um, this I have seen a change in how I practice. And so when I was in medical school, school and residency and for the first couple of years after residency, we would see rotavirus in our babies and our toddlers, just like we see flu. We would have a rotavirus season, which was March and April. And we'd have, and I saw so much of it as, um, as, a, as a doc and as a resident. I could, and so many of us did, that we could literally walk in the room and it has a very characteristic smell that we knew that the kid actually had rotavirus even before any of our tests came back. And those kids, some of them came in sick as not as far as how dehydrated they, dehydrated they were. And then guess what? Then now we have a vaccine against rotavirus. It's an oral vaccine. So it's a liquid that we give to kids at two, four and six months of age. And I have to say that since I would see usually March and April, I would see kids daily coming in with rotavirus, multiple kids daily coming in with rotavirus um, into the hospital setting. Um, now I'm lucky if I see probably one or two or three a year getting admitted for rotavirus. It's just something that is so incredibly less than what I used to see. It's, it's just something as far as my career goes, seeing what modern medicine can do, it's just very, very impressive. Okay, next. All right, so this graph I think is kind of interesting. It's not my favorite graph because I think it can be a little confusing, but it's really um, interesting. So all these little squiggly lines and then the dates are on the bottom, but they all show different diseases. So measles, which we, if you guys remember, I talked about um, last time with my, um, my presentation and how measles is just so dang contagious. So you can see that measles, um, green line jumping up and down. Um, typhoid is that um, one that I have a vaccine for when you go to other countries, but the story that you might've read about in middle school was typhoid Mary, right? Um, whooping cough is that pertussis. I kind of talked, we talked about that a little bit. And then that one, that big blue one is diphtheria, which I find until I, I have to say, I, I obviously learned about diphtheria in medical school and I will now teach you about it too in residency. Um, but I didn't, until I started teaching you guys and, and putting this um, project together, that I really appreciate how big of a deal diphtheria was in our history. For it to be our number one cause of pediatric deaths at 1900, and I as a doctor, a pediatric doctor who only works in hospitals, so to remind you, I don't work in the clinic, I don't do your you know, school physicals or sports physicals. I don't give vaccines out, you know, on, on the schedules or any of that. I just work in hospitals. And the fact that I can honestly stand, sit, be on the screen in front of you and say, I have never seen a case of diphtheria, nor any of the colleagues that I have worked, worked with throughout the years, because of course we all talk and we all meet and we have meetings and we talk about our good cases. None of my colleagues that I've ever worked with have seen a case of diphtheria either in the United States 
is an impressive, impressive statement. So you can see, right, um, that diphtheria vaccine came in at um, 1920. And from there on out, remember, it takes a couple of years, and we'll see this with COVID too, to get everybody vaccinated who wants to get vaccinated. So, you know, that'll be based on, you know, what size city you live in. Do you live in an urban area, rural area? You know, obviously nowadays it would be insurance and whatnot. Back then it would be, if I live on a farm in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, am I traveling to a city that I could get my kids with a diphtheria vaccine? So there were so many um, uh, barriers to getting a vaccine that that's why you see that little bit of a bump even after the vaccine has is available to the public. There's just barriers to medical care. But you can just see the, the downslope of really all of our diseases. And that kind of goes back to um, what, um, what I kind of talked about too, as far as the change of industrialized societies, and I'll kind of go into that too. So we were already seeing a decrease due to a lot of public health policies that have gone, that went into effect kind of between 1900 and 1920. Also a very interesting piece of history as far as when those public health things came into effect. So it's that, it's vaccines, and then also when um, antibiotics um, came in to help explain this, um, this graph. I have to let you know that my anti-vaccine political groups out there um, will show me, show me, so medicine, this graph and say, see, we don't need vaccines. These rates were going down ahead of time. They, they were gonna go down anyway. And I will um, politely and professionally disagree with them. Um, I am now teaching you guys that I can explain the decrease by these, um, these introductions of public health measures, but it's still, the graph would look very, very different if vaccines didn't come into play. Next slide. So causes of infant death nowadays, right? So birth defects, and I kind of talked a little bit about that on my last, um, my last lecture, as far as that can be a metabolic defect, it can be something to do with your chromosomes. Um, a lot of these um, conditions live, um, uh, we have amazing, it shows you the amazing aspect of science, as far as a lot of these babies you can have maybe live a certain amount of time. Um, my most recent case was last time I worked, which was um, downtown, and I had a four-month-old baby on my service. Um, I ended up loving this family, and I'm very humbled by them allowing me. To Good afternoon, Bruin. Are you <laughs> ready for Spirit Week? It will be the week of October 9th. Hang on. This is uh, the October 5th through the 8th. Sorry. Get ready for a week full of fun recipes and our own spirit. Have a great rest of your weekend, Bruin. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Awesome. Um, so uh, I was very humbled by this family um, allowing me to be a part of their journey. So I came on service, which means I come in for my week of work um, and I take over all the patients that are from my previous doctor and my checkout from my colleague from the previous doctor on that previous week was we have this baby four month old baby and she listed all these problems kind of problems the kid had already had a couple of surgeries and you know wasn't eating and wasn't tolerating food and we have ways to get people to eat and um, and then her comment was um, I, I haven't really met the family. I called them once or twice. They really haven't come in. They live, from far, they live far away. And so I was kind of like, oh boy, um, you know, what am I getting myself into? And this kid wasn't tolerating feed. So um, I come on service. I basically get social work and to help me out. And we call, I basically get this family to come in. And I have a meeting and sit down with me. And so we call these things fair conferences. And so I had both mom and dad meet with me and nursing and social work. And I'm not sure who else was there. Um, and they were very open, were very approachable. And they basically said, 
we knew during her preg when mom was pregnant during the pregnancy that this baby wasn't supposed to survive and but we decided to continue the pregnancy anyway and this baby came out and she's now four months of life and has this huge list of problems but they were very grateful that they had they had had the time that they had had with her um, but they were very realistic very honest and basically said i also don't want her to suffer um, they were very much questioning her quality of life um, as far as, you know, is everything that we in medicine were doing to her, was it doing more harm than good? And so long story short, these are some of the conversations that I find myself in with this, with this job. We, um, she wasn't tolerating oral feeds. I was feeding her through a tube and and so I was ended up having to feed her through an IV. And I can't send a, a baby that small home that way with um, getting feeds through the central line. So I told them that and they said, okay, well then let's get her off of it. We want her home. So I, I knowing the, the, the understanding of this family, I knowing that this child wasn't supposed to live anyway to birth, I knowing the list of her medical problems within the, her four months of life, I was very comfortable with following this family's lead. So we, I basically weaned down her feeds through her central line within probably a day. I have to be a little bit careful not to do that too fast. And I started feeding her through these tubes that were feeding her gut. And um, sometimes she was okay with it. And sometimes the parents knew how to stop the feeds if they thought she was in pain. And we went through all of what could happen sending her home this way. And the parents were right on board. The dad was ex-military. And um, we sent her home knowing that there was a good chance that she would pass because of her not tolerating her feet. And I just got an email this week saying that she did pass um, last week. And so I bring that this story up for several reasons. One of them to show you that birth defects, even though it's our, one of our major causes of deaths in this country, a lot of these children, children would have never ever lived beyond a day or two of life um, back even 20 years ago. And we, with modern technology and science, were able to prolong life. Um, I also bring up this story to show you the difficult conversations that I, um, I and doctors do have with families. Um, and I also bring up this conversation to show you the sense of humility um, and um, grace that you need um, if you choose to go into a world of, um, of medicine. This family was, probably, was one of the the most impressive families that I have probably ever met because they very much knew in their mind what they wanted and what they didn't want for their, their child. A lot of families don't know that and that's a very difficult road. So it's a, um, it's, a, it's, it's a story I share with you, not to make you super sad, um, but also, um, but to show you a different side of medicine and what I do. What an incredible story. What an incredible story. Um, and that was only last week or last time I worked and that whole I that week I was um, telling Mr. Sperb was a tough week for me because I had everything um, thrown at me that week that I think I've ever had to deal with as a pediatric hospitalist. I also had a sex trafficking case that week um, which also made my job quite interesting and but I also bring that up for you guys to know that yes Stuff like that is out there, and it does happen here in the Denver area in Colorado. All right, so causes of infant death, prematurity. Obviously, um, we have babies surviving um, now that could never survive before. Um, even though they're born super early, that's the whole area of neonatal ICU is in charge of those small, tiny little babies. Um, maternal complications of pregnancy. SIDS is that sudden infant death syndrome. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then injuries, whether it's a car accident, accidental suffocation. So if a 
parent, if the baby sleeps in a bed with, um, with a parent and the parent had a couple glasses of wine, um, it is not uncommon for that parent to roll over on a baby um, in the middle of the night, even if they're not under any sort of substance. So um, we, that's one of the reasons why we say, please don't have your babies um, sleep in the same bed with you. And then shaken baby is um, a well-known um, syndrome or um, issue, and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit too. You gotta let me know, Mr. Surf, how I'm doing on time because I'm finding myself going out on more tangents than I usually do. We, we have plenty of time, so. Okay, um, so shaken baby is basically that coup, counter coup of, and we talk about this, that no matter how upset or overtired and exhausted and frustrated you are with a baby, we always tell our newborn parents to, it is okay and all right to put a baby down in a safe place, like in their crib or something, and then to go outside for a walk, fresh and fresh air, enough to do whatever you need to do to calm down and get recentered and um, pull it back together and then go back and deal with that baby. We do see, unfortunately, um, a, more than I would like to see, of infant deaths and infant long-term permanent complications from the coup, counter coup, so it's that shaking of the baby, of the brain hitting the back side of the brain, of the skull and then the front side of the skull that causes permanent brain damage. Next. Um, so this is what I talked about already. Reasons for reduction in mortality. Why does that graph even look a little bit more like that slope was going down even before vaccines came in? And this is the public health um, uh, programs that came into effect in the early 1900s. Super exciting. So safe drinking water. Who would have thought? You know, who would have thought? Things that we take for granted nowadays. But if you live in some of our developing countries in this world, totally different story. Sewage disposal pro uh, programs. Um, pasteurization of milk, um, that was in 1908. So um, if you take milk directly from a cow, you can get certain diseases that way. So instead we zap it basically, get rid of all that bacteria and then give it to our babies and our children. Maternal education. So yes, I, and I still see this to this day as far as just cultural aspects of how to take care of, um, of children. Um, one of an easy one that I have seen is, so sometimes you have your belly button, whether it's an innie or an outie, and there are some cultures out there that think that if you have an out, if the baby has an outie belly button, you need to wrap the baby and wrap the, that belly button so it's flat against the abdominal wall, and then that will help so the baby doesn't develop an outie. That doesn't work, but to this day, I still see um, that in um, certain cultures that that's what they should do. So whenever I find something a little odd on a baby, I always ask. But there was so much more of that back 100 years ago that just by maternal education was huge. Um, vaccines, so that, like we said, diphtheria was 1920. Sulfa antibiotics, which is what you might have heard of, which is Bactrim. Um, was the first antibiotic come to the market, which was as late as 1937. And then the penicillins didn't come to market until 1940s. If you think of all of history to know that we haven't even had antibiotics on this planet for 100 years yet, I think is an amazing thought. That if we haven't even had antibiotics 100 years yet. Okay, next. All right, so diphtheria. I promised you I'd talk about it a little bit. Um, uh, a little bit more. So diphtheria, we have an antitoxin, um, which I think is um, super fascinating too, if you're interested in um, any medicine and the history of medicine. And that we started using even before 1900s to help explain that slope. Um, and then you can also see the diphtheria vaccine. So I think my next slide is I talk, what the heck is diphtheria? So let's talk about what diphtheria is. Hopefully that's the next slide if I remember correctly. Yes, okay, good. So diphtheria, remember, this is that, that number one illness that I haven't seen um, my entire time in practicing, which I think is so impressive. So here you can kind of see it, headaches, fevers, chills. Um, and basically what, <laughs> what I remember for my boards and my tests is this picture. 
So this picture you see like in the back of the throat, so of course you see the teeth and the tongue, but in the back of the throat, you see this white stuff, right? So that's basically this grayish membrane. So it, it makes, um, the Pteria makes this, what we call a pseudo membrane. That's all kind of connected, basically a, a pus kind of, kind of seal, I guess to say. Um, and it basically just clogs your breathing tube or clogs your trachea. So you just can't breathe anymore. So that's what diphtheria is. Hmm. All right. So we kind of talked about um, children being the weak, frail ones, how people just kind of shrugged and said, yeah, they kind of, it's not uncommon for them to die. And so it really wasn't until um, the 18, mid 1800s that people really started thinking, maybe we should start paying attention to these kids. Why do they seem to die a little bit more? And with all of these constant questions is, um, is how, you know, how science keeps progressing, right? Is, and what all, all your kindergarten teachers um, told you to do is keep on questioning, keep on wondering. And that's where, um, where and how um, pediatrics became its own specialty, but it didn't happen until the mid, mid, mid 1800s. So one of the first ways that pediatrics really kind of came to the forefront as far as its own specialty is when you think of pediatrics and what the common citizen would have seen back then is how do families treat their children, right? So children were considered property of their fathers. Um, and so, you know, back then it wouldn't be uncommon that if you steal candy that you get the snot beat out of you, right? You don't necessarily see that anymore, but the history, our history has always in this country has always been that those are family affairs and nobody should be involved in them. You still see this throughout the um, country, throughout the rest of the world. So even though, you know, beating your kids to a pulp isn't okay in this country, it doesn't mean at this time, right now, there isn't a kid in um, Afghanistan, which um, we know is they have a whole different idea of how you treat your kids than we do in this country. And kids are still be getting beaten the snot out of them if they do something wrong. So it's very how you treat your kids is very different based on what country you live in. In this country, we can see it in time and history, but also very cultural as well. So it's actually a difficult topic to kind of discuss. So in this country, in 1874, um, children, um, there was charitable organizations were developed for um, the protection of children because we would see child abuse and people were obviously, because we're human beings with a soul, <laughs> I'd like to think, that we would, the society, our society got disturbed by seeing kids just getting beaten. So, but there were no laws in this country that could say whether you could or could not beat your child and to what extent. So if you beat your child to a point of the child dying, that there was no legal recourse for that. That was, there was no laws in the book saying whether that was okay or not okay. But there were laws in the book saying you couldn't beat your horse to death without having legal per percussions to that. But there was nothing in the book saying that you couldn't beat your child to death without having any. So they, a lot of the child abuse cases, there weren't that many, would fall under animal cruelty laws because there was nothing that existed for our children. So this was kind of also came about at the same time. The microphone would die. Still down. You good yet? Yes, now it's good. Yes. Okay. Where did I where did I leave off? Just like ten seconds ago about child uh, labor laws and or uh, yeah. beat your animal. So yeah, so there weren't that many that came to notice of the authorities, but if there were, then they would try to prosecute under the animal cruelty laws at the time. Next slide. 
So the big hallmark case that we look at as far as how you treat your children and what laws were added and added in this country is is this little girl. So her name was uh, Mary Ellen Wilson. Um, as far as we know, she was placed, um, she was born in 1864, and she was placed with what we call a boarder. So that was also during the time when they had these boarding houses where you would rent out a room in your house. And it kind of sounds like she was just kind of abandoned and left um, with one of the other, like, basically room neighbors. And it only wasn't until she was two years old that it kind of came to the um, attention of basically of the government, right? So um, um, I, actually, I bite my tongue. I don't even know if it came to the attention of the government. So it says here that neighbors asked a Methodist. Oh, wait, I digress. Hold on. Back up. So she, at the age of two, she was placed with a family in a New York tenement housing. So basically, once again, free government housing with some other random family. And I, when I look back on these cases, it's still a little confusing to me as far as if this was all just word of mouth that she got placed with this random family, or if there was something in the government, or if churches were involved or whatnot. But somehow she ended up in this New York tenement housing or like free housing in um, with this family. And then when you read the history on this and the stories on this, the neighbors around this family um, were really starting to become worried about the yelling and the screaming and whatnot that they heard from this one apartment. So the neighbors asked a Methodist mission worker, this Etta Angel, to check in on the child. Um, and then um, Etta went into this apartment and saw horrible living conditions, unsanitary, and then they found this girl who had significant cut bruises, cuts, bruises, and scars. And you can, this is an actual picture of her. So if you take a look at her legs, I think it really kind of shows you the significance of, of her injuries. I mean, these are open wounds on her leg that I can, that I can see much less I can also see it on her scalp and um, forehead. Um, I'm also kind of looking to see as far as signs of malnutrition. Um, I probably would have to look at a couple other pictures, but looking at, um, at her hair a little bit too, um, we can look for signs of malnutrition. She's got a big um, bruise on top of her forehead. So anyway, um, so Etta couldn't do anything, right? So she approached the New York City of authorities and they couldn't really do anything either. There's no laws on the books protecting this little girl. So I give credit a lot to Miss Etta Angel for she didn't stop. So she approached um, this Henry Berg, a leader in the animal humane uh, movement in the United States and founder of what we now know today as the ASPCA, right? As far as Association for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And it was with that avenue that they were able to start um, producing some significant change. Not significant, it was very, I take that back. It was very slow to at least start addressing the protection of children. So I'm gonna read this to you, even though I know you can read it yourself, but I find it very interesting because these aren't uncommon stories. So my father and mother are both dead. I don't know how old I am. I have no recollection of a time when I did not live with the Connollys. So the Connollys was this random family she was placed with. Mama, who is Mrs. Connolly, has been in the habit of whipping and beating me almost every day. She used to whip me with a twisted whip, a raw hide. The whip always left a black and blue mark on my body. I have now the black and blue marks on my head, which were made by Mama. I also, I also have a cut um, on the left side of my forehead, which was made by a pair of scissors. She struck me with the scissors and cut me. I have no recollection of, I have no recollection of, uh, I have no recollection of ever being, of ever having been kissed by anyone. Have never been kissed by mama. I have never been taken on my mama's lap and caressed or petted. I never dared to speak to anyone because if I did, I would get whipped. I do not know for what I was whipped. Mama never said anything to me when she whipped me. I do not want to go back to live with mama because she beats me so. I have no recollection ever being on the street in my life. So 
I think it's interesting that she was never let out of the apartment. And so she never really had a chance to ask for help or get help. But even if somebody did come to the apartment and she talked to somebody, she would later be read. So this is obviously a, a extreme example of this child really did have no help except for Miss Etta Angel. Next. So, well, when did things change? So Dr. Kemp, who also the building here next to the Children's Hospital in um, Denver is named after, published an article titled The Batter Battered Child Syndrome in 1962. So as a pediatrician and as a family practice doctor, um, um, also takes care of children. Um, we, this is where things started from as far as when I assess a child, um, signs and symptoms that I can look for if the child is being physically abused by 1967. So think about that. That's still almost, what, 80 years, 100, almost 100 years from poor Mary Ellen. All states had mandatory reporting laws for physical abuse and neglect. So mandatory reporting means if I find it, I have to report it to authorities. Um, 1976, still very late, mandatory reporting laws on sexual abuse in this country. Once again, if you think about that, very late. But if, uh, if a child was being sexually abused in a household or in a family, it was always just seen as that's a family affair and, and nobody else should, um, should intervene. So what types of child abuse do we see? Um, this pie chart on the top is the most common, and I think all teachers will definitely agree with this, is neglect. 60% of child abuse, at least seen in this country, but I would guess that. You're muted again. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Am I good? I think yes, I'm good. now good. Okay. Um, and then I've seen different stats of being sexually abused. Um, I've seen uh, girls, one in 10. Um, but this, um, this article that I also found says one in four girls will be sexually abused and one in six boys before they turn 18. That's heartbreaking. Jeez. Okay. Um, okay, so when you look at child abuse, it's one of the things that we look at in our society is do they live from their child abuse? Um, so if you look at this, um, younger than 1% if they experience physical child abuse or neglect, 41% um, of those deaths are younger than a year age. That should make sense to you, right? As far as what stage in your life you are most vulnerable and I would say it's the very very young and it's the very very old right so that younger that 41 percent of fatalities in this country younger than a year of age should make sense to you um it's a lot of it I, I hate saying that but a lot of these deaths are due to that shaken baby syndrome that I, I talked about earlier and then the next group is the one to three years old next Okay, so signs of child abuse. So um, physical signs of child abuse, emotional, sexual signs, and then signs of neglect, um, which is our, like per the other diagram is our most common. So I'll go through those. So, un, and like I said, teachers are big ones to help pick this up. Um, number one, unsuitable um, clothing for weather. So it's snowing outside and they come outside in shorts and a t-shirt. Dirty or unbathed, extreme hunger, and um, apparent lack of supervision. It's for this reason that we now have um, school school lunch programs and school breakfast programs and whatnot. It's all because of this. All right, so you could challenge me and say, well, you know, that's when they're kids, but when they're grown up, you know, why should we care so much? Well, we know that um, it leaves a lot of emotional scars on a lot of these a lot of these kids when they grow up as an adult, and so they might have anger management problems. They might have anxiety problems. They're at a higher risk of depression. They're at a higher risk of suicide. Um, as far as what we should care about as 
I mean, we should care about all of that, but as far as government and insurance companies, um, talk, you know, as far as putting a dollar sign to it, um, we know that they will um, uh, assess, access the, um, the, uh, um, the health system more frequently than, than somebody who has not been abused. So they, because they have anxiety problems or, you know, or whatnot, they just in general um, go to the doctor more frequently, go to ER, you know, go to the ER more frequently, have more of a higher risk of health problems throughout the rest of their life. Hmm. So next one is, well, what about if there is you know, um, if if there is abuse also in, in the household from an adult to a child, that does have permanent um, imprints on the children as far as dealing with emotions and dealing with anger issues when they are parents too. So we call it the cycle of abuse because a child who has grown up, grows up in an abusive household is more likely to be that way to their own children when they grow up. And I applaud those kids who are very conscious about it and when they do become parents they say I am going to be a different parent than my parent was to me and I'm going to be a better mom better dad than than what I have and I applaud those people next all right so my goal as a pediatrician and I would think any goal of any parent is to attain optimal physical health which is we kind of obviously talked about with the medicine behind it, mental health and social health and well-being for all infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. Next. All right, so what, so I, as well as every, pretty much every pediatrician in this country is part of the American Academy of Pediatrics. That is our organization that all pediatricians are under. And then we have educational movements in this country to help make, help make those goals, right? The best physical, mental, and social well-being for all of our children. So we have well, campaigns, I don't wanna call them advertising campaigns, but campaigns to, for how to attain those goals. And through that is education. So what I talked about is um, never shake a baby. That's, that's the campaign against um, shaken baby syndrome. Um, breastfeeding is best. There was a big push in the 60s and 70s in this country that formula is much better than breastfeeding. And we have shown, and I have another slide about this, countless reasons why that's untrue. Putting fluoride in our water. Um, dental health in this country is not great among our um, lower income families. So just alone putting fluoride in our drinking water has shown a big decrease in the amount of cavities and better um, oral health in our most vulnerable populations where they don't brush their teeth every day. It's something that we definitely see a lot of. Unlike the state of Nevada, Mr. Stirrup. I, I tell you, I'm happy I don't live there anymore. I mean, those, those they were crazy with fluoride. Yeah, I don't. And I think that's still standing too, where they, the state of Nevada have had some big campaign by a bunch of people and there's no fluoride in their drinking water. But I'd be, I don't know enough about that whole issue to be able to show like what their rates were of dental issues before and after when they took that fluoride out. So here's, a, you know, as an adult, I lived in the state of Nevada for nine years. And my dental program, I used to go four times a year for a cleaning for my teeth. Four times a year, that's really frequent. Yes, and they would spend about an hour, you know, with that pick in my teeth and, you know, this, this, what we all love. So now I, I'm here and I, I really enjoy my dentist. I trust him. I think he's a much better dentist than I had all nine years in Nevada. And it was, it's amazing here. It's like 15 minutes done and it's twice a year. I'm, That's twice a year. That's why I said four times a year is a lot. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like torturing myself that much. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, even as an adult, which it wasn't as effective as a child, they still would, you know, I'd go to the dentist and like, did you want fluoride? So when I was my third at, in my thirties, they would put those fluoride trays in my mouth with a little uh, thing sucking out. And that's pretty that's pretty impressive that they're doing it as an adult yeah so 
you know, my dentist knew that there was a problem with it, but when they, you know, it's like the people were crazy when they would bring up, we're going to want fluoridated water. I mean, you thought they were taking away people's rights. And I'm like, oh my gosh, your teeth are rotten here. Yeah. Um, I'm one that I'm sure all of you guys um, are well familiar with, and that's bike helmet. Um, you have to realize that bike helmet thing was both during mine and Mr. Stirrup's lifetime. Um, I, unfortunately, as a child, had um, a brother, a friend of mine's younger brother in beginning of eighth grade killed by, on his bike by being hit by a car. I had a eighth grade at eighth grade graduation week. I had another friend of mine in my class that was killed by on his bike by being hit by a car. And my sophomore year in high school, I had a friend who also was on the side of a road and was. Um... Oh, your microphone went out again. Ah! Microphone. Not there yet, not there, not there. Oh, there we go. There you go. So eighth, I, eighth grade, eighth yeah. grade where you fell off. And um, so I've had three deaths in my early life from uh, kids, of fellow kids, um, killed on from cars being on bikes. And I, it's hard for me to this day to look back at that and wonder if any of those three kids that I knew and obviously loved um, if they would have survived if they had a helmet on. But we didn't have helmet helmet rules and laws back when we were kids. So that's 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 a, something also seen in my lifetime. Um, and then also this last one is you know teaching the public um, don't drink and don't get drunk when you're pregnant. So all these things that you guys take for granted, like well of course I wouldn't get drunk when I'm pregnant. These are things that are really not that advice that is not that old. Um, when I went to South Africa, um, I did um, and worked in the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town. And they, right north of Cape Town, beautiful area, but it's all wine country. And of course, South Africa, what we know with white and, and people of darker skin color, um, they would sometimes, in, throughout, during history, would pay their vineyard workers, their slaves, with wine. And um, a lot of times that might have been the only nutrition that they would have gotten. So looking to throughout history, as far as the babies that were born um, from alcoholic mothers is also, once again, looking backwards to um, solve problems going forward. Okay, next slide. All right, some more things to talk about. Safe to sleep, that's to prevent SIDS. That's that whole... Um, baby dies in their sleep um, between the ages of about two months to six months. Um, to prevent that, we ask parents to always have babies sleep on their back. We ask parents not to smoke around babies. Um, we think it's a ventilation um, type thing, but that's safe to sleep is that babies always sleep on their back to help reduce the risk of SIDS. Smoking while pregnant, also you would think would be well known by this point, but as early as um, Mr. Stirrup and I's childhood, that was not a well-known thing. <laughs> um, childhood obesity, thanks to whatever your political association affiliation is, thanks, thank you to Mrs. Obama. She really did a great job bringing this to the forefront um, and helping us out with this and addressing it. Um, also smoking around kids, and um, inducing, help making their asthma worse. Car seats, also within our lifetimes as far as kids needing to sit in car seats. And then one of the great campaigns that I love too that's come out recently is reading to kids. Um, what I think just amazingly fascinating is if you read to a baby and you would think, you know, what can a six month old get from a book? But if you read to your babies, that by their second birthday, there is a difference. Still not there. <laughs> Microphone's still off. Yep. There we go. 
Okay. Read by your second birthday. Yeah, I promise I'm almost done, guys. Um, <laughs> that there's a difference in intelligence by their second birthday. So that means if you read to a baby that something absorbs somehow, I think is absolutely amazing. Okay, next card. Okay. All right, so I have to, one of our newest, <laughs> newest campaigns to talk about with our kids and with our parents is vaping, e-cigarettes, tooling, as far as, and the research is just now starting to really come out because as you've learned with COVID too, good research takes time. So I don't know, does anybody, is anybody else on the lecture series talking about vaping yet, Mr. Sharp? You're my first. All right. Well, hopefully as the years keep going and more research comes out, there'll be more of us talking to you guys about it. But the big idea is that it's not good. So these two, these are two CT scans up here. Um, and the one, uh, the CT scan on the left is the normal one. Anything that is black is the lungs. The middle thing in the middle is the heart. Air shows up black on CT scans and x-rays, okay? You want those lungs to be nice and black because that shows that you've got a lot of air in there and not a lot of gook. So the other one is the, X, the CT scans that we're seeing on our young adults that are vaping. And so it has, as you can tell, the black is not as obvious and there's all this white and really it's just white crap that's sitting in their lungs and causing really quite, uh, is causing damage. So um, uh, as far as we have nicotine poisoning, um, poisoning symptoms, we will have toddlers coming in and well, and teenagers that are doing too much vaping coming in with that, that's on your left side. Um, and then you guys gotta realize that the vaping and the e-cigarettes and dueling, and hopefully you guys are starting to get more educated on this is that the amount of nicotine in these things is so much more than a regular cigarette. And that's why we're seeing such strong addiction, ad, addiction properties for it and such strong and very hard um, addiction cases for kids to start trying to get themselves off of vaping and, and, and e-cigarettes is really hard because that chemical addiction hits much stronger than, than cigarettes do. So if you guys are doing it, and I would say, you know what, go ahead and try. Try for a month not to do it and see how strong that push is. You might be surprised. If you need help, please ask your pediatrician. You can always ask your parents to go talk to your doctor for, you could say, X, Y, Z reasons. A lot of those doctors um, will, have the, um, will have your parents step out of the room um, and whatever you tell your pediatrician or your doctor, they do not have to tell your parents about it. So you can get treatment and discuss this if you're, um, if you're ready to quit. Um, and there is that patient doctor um, confidentiality. So if you guys are struggling, I would, um, I would really suggest that you try to get help for this. This is not easy to come off by yourself. So, but we're, um, as far as the addiction properties, you have to realize nicotine does affect areas of your brain and that your brain technically isn't done developing until 25 years of age. So that should make you kind of pause a little bit. Okay. All right, so back on vaping, um, this slide is obviously a year old, um, but basically in um, August last year, they are, the CDC felt like they had enough evidence to show that, you know what, this is bad, and we're strongly putting out there that people really need to, um, to stop vaping. And as far as the medical people, um, as far as the doctors and what we're um, seeing is in this kind of um, bottom um, right-hand corner, as far as um, the lipoy pneumonia, it's a fancy word of, of all those tiny little cells and vessels in your lungs that are so delicate that they're getting filled with a lipid or basically filled with fat. And if those, those things are filled with fat due to the damage, um, it's really hard to have that oxygen carbon dioxide um, um, exchange. All right, in summary, 
but I will, even though I covered a ton in this lecture, I will at least cover Dr. Nell's tips. So if you come to me and say, Dr. Nell, I want to be a parent someday, and how can I guarantee, since this is the society we live in, how can I guarantee that I'll have uh, the most healthiest kid I could possibly have? Or how can I do the best for my kid? Um, which I completely applaud for you. And so I would say breastfeeding is best. Um, respect the need for sleep, including all of you teenagers. Oh, you got <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Oh, there you go. There you're back. What happens when you use your kid's computer? <laughs> um, so respect the need for sleep. You can sleep, good sleep and lack of sleep. It's a tie, a tied with obesity issues. It's tied with school performance. It's tied with depression. It's it's um it's tied with like how to, you know, your anger management, managing your emotions, which I know all of you teenagers have a whole lot of. So the need for sleep is so underrated. You guys really need, and kids from all ages really need good night's sleep. Proper nutrition. Stop eating Doritos and a can of Coke for dinner. You'd be surprised. Um, parents and caretakers, don't smoke around your kids. And I don't care any kind of smoke, whether it's cigarettes, um, or marijuana or anything, don't do it around your kids. And then the AAP, the American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics, and the, the campaigns that I've put out for you. Car seats, child-proof your home, infant sleep on the backs. Swim lessons by, by four years of age. Lock up your gun. Bike helmets, never shake the baby. The importance of vitamin D in infants, etc. cetera. It goes on and on. Next, let's, okay, so I, Promise you benefits of breastfeeding. Also, amazingly um, attached to so many so many things, decrease of neonatal and infant infections. Really, doctor? Still no. <laughs> Am I back yet? Yes. Jeez, ah, I'm almost done, I promise you guys. <laughs> so helps with your immune system. It's amazing. Lower risk of asthma, allergies, and eczema when you guys get older. Lower risk of obesity. Seriously? Breastfeeding decreases obesity? Yes. Lower rate of ear infection. Lower rate of, in my so in my tiny, tiny babies that are born early, those guys do so much better with mom's breast milk than any other formula. I can give them. Lower rates of SIDS, which is that sudden infant death sy syndrome. Lower rates of, or has protective against diabetes. And weird, lower rates, and then it helps mom too, as far as osteoporosis and cancer risk. Um, has higher IQ in childhood. Um, and plus breastfeeding is cheaper, it's easier, it's faster. Um, and then we've even done studies as far as crying at six months of age, and we showed decreased crying episodes and throwing fits in our babies. It's impressive on just breastfeeding alone and what it all can cover. Next. So, and then you say, okay, Dr. Nell, I want a healthy kid, but then I also want the smartest kid in the class, and I'll have to say, well, that depends a lot on your genetics. But I also want to say it also depends on how you interact with your kids. So talk to them, look at them, pay attention to them, look into their eye, get down on their level, read to them. I talked to you about that. Respect the need for sleep. These kids still need naps for a long, longer time than our society allows them to do it. Allow them to play, free play. Even you guys, teenagers, having time to do what you want, not on a screen, but having time to explore life and your environment is key. Being outside, there's so many studies as far as how just being outside is um, has so many um, benefits. Um, also, like I kind of mentioned about limit your screen time. Super hard right now. Totally get it, but know that the, being on a screen is not helpful. Um, and then for kids, when you babies and how do you communicate with, with them when they don't have the language to communicate back with you? 
is hold them, touch them, hug them, and love them unconditionally. Even when you're super frustrated, don't tell them, oh, you're a pain in the A. Say, I really didn't like your choice right now. Don't, with your criticism of them, tell them you don't like their actions. Don't say, I don't like you or, you, or label them as a bad kid. Just say, I don't like your choices. All right, I think that's it. This is what I usually answer um, your questions. I love this Albert Einstein quote because it, it's exactly what I, what science pushes from all of us is keep thinking, keep wondering, and keep questioning. And kids are awesome at this. And you know what? Teenagers are awesome at this too. Don't stop, don't be embarrassed. Follow your heart, follow your brain, follow your questions. Um, life is fun. So thank you guys. Yeah. Let's see. Where's my stop record? Right there. <laughs> okay, stop share. And oh, did you